Hello, everyone, and welcome to the um, America's Imagery Webinar Series, Part 3, Advanced Remote Sensing. We got a great one for you guys uh, this week. As you saw, the movie star, uh, Vinay, uh, has joined us. I'm just kidding, guys. He's, uh, he's a product manager from the uh, imagery team. Uh, he focuses on analytics and AI, which we'll be talking about uh, this, this week, along with Kyle Talbot. And as always, we have Kurt Schwope, uh, who's the uh, manager for uh, imagery at Esri. And my name is, is Milkiadis Walter Rodriguez. And I'm a solution engineer um, in charge of business development in the Americas, uh, mostly focused in the national government side of the house. Uh, but as you can see, a pretty, pretty high interest on the, um, on the imagery, imagery sector. So in case you missed it, there was uh, two webinars that we've done already, one for photogrammetry last Tuesday and uh, imagery management that we did last Thursday. I still owe you guys uh, that recording. So if you register, don't worry, uh, you'll be receiving that one fairly soon. Uh, for today, we got the advanced remote sensing. And then on Thursday, we're gonna have working with drones, which will be presented by uh, Kurt Schwope, uh, whose video you can see right now and, uh, and, and Kyle Talbot. So I'd like to, to pass the word over to Vinay for him to go ahead and get started. Um, as we're changing screens, I just want to remind you that, uh, that there is a survey I'd like for you guys to fill out at the back end. You guys have done a wonderful job of, of filling out that survey. Uh, it gives us some, some much needed feedback as to um, what you guys liked, what you didn't like. And I, and I do share this with the product team so the uh, do understand uh, what you guys are working in and how uh, Esri can best help you um, and your business. So with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Vinay. All right. Thanks, Milk. So today we've got a lot of content. We've got about 20 different demonstrations, which we've squeezed, we've packed it into this one and a half hour session that we're going to talk about image analysis. So You've in this webinar series, probably you've probably seen this diagram show up many times. It's kind of an overview of the imagery capabilities within ArcGIS. We support all forms of content from different sensors. We support different formats, different modalities that exist within your organization. It also comes with great content that you can consume directly from within the living atlas. The content, it can be managed and we make it accessible through image management components, primarily using mosaic data sets to manage large collections of imagery. This also has been talked about in the previous webinars. The map production capabilities focus on tools to generate derived products from imagery such as orthophotos, DDMs, 3D mesh. The analysis and AI capabilities provides you with tools to extract information from imagery. These also include a wide range of machine learning, deep learning tools, so on and so forth. And lastly, visualization exploitation capabilities are the wide range of tools to enable interpretation of the imagery and the information products that we generate. So our focus today is gonna to be on image analysis. Image analysis is really about extracting meaningful information from imagery. This right here, the spectrum that you're seeing is a laundry list of some of the key imagery analytical capabilities within ArcGIS. It ranges all the way from feature extraction using machine learning, deep learning. We can perform multi-dimensional analysis, change detection on image cubes, to tools to really perform advanced spectral analysis on different types of data. And if you look at this slide, you can see there are pieces to perform not just image analysis, but there's also raster analysis, like distance modeling, suitability analysis, hydrological modeling, and so on. Now, all of these products are accessible using our flagship desktop product, using ArcGIS Pro then the advanced capabilities are accessible through the image analyst extension and the spatial analyst extension. And if you really want to scale out your processing, you can use image server to distribute scale and optimize your processing to create information products. 
Now, with this quick introduction, I'll hand it over to Kyle, who will talk a little bit about raster functions. He'll give you an introduction to the image analyst extension and as well. And he's got a series of demonstrations that he'll be covering. Kyle? Uh, I believe I have to stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, here we go. Do we see my screen? Yep, you're good to go. Yep. Cool. All right, yeah, so I'm gonna give you, a, start off with an introduction of uh, working with um, raster analyst, um, doing uh, advanced remote sensing techniques within the ArcGIS Pro. To begin, I wanna start off by introducing the concept of raster functions. Um, for those of you not as aware of, um, the, not as familiar with ArcGIS Pro. Those who've been working in desktop, you've you've been aware of, uh, you're probably aware of the geoprocessing tools that we have, um, as well as some of the the raster geoprocessing tools that have been available um, in, in ArcMap over the years. Raster functions are a little bit different. So what they do is they're operations that'll apply processing directly to the pixels on the imagery and raster data sets. And that's, a that's different from geoprocessing, which will write out a whole new raster to a disk. So the analysis will be done on the fly, and that makes it very, very fast. Um, which is very helpful when you're working with large raster data sets. You just get the, the calculations on the pixels as you need them. And now through various different um, extensions, there are over 125 different raster functions available in ArcGIS Pro. You get some of those uh, straight with, uh, with, a, with a standard ArcGIS Pro license, some some initial uh, correction, conversion, statistics tools, et cetera, that you can that you can work with, including the Python raster functions, which will which enable you to um, to work with uh, these raster functions in in our ArcPy environments. And then through other different extensions, including the image analyst extension, you get additional raster functions, some such as uh, some additional statistics. Um, math tools as well as classification. Um, and then with the spatial analyst extension, you also get uh, many of those additional raster functions as well as some advanced tools such as distance modeling, hydrology, uh, view shed analysis, et cetera. So we won't have time to show all of the raster functions here. Um, but a lot of the functions are workflow centric. Um, so here are some of the some of the examples of some advanced workflows that we, we won't have time to show today. Again, some of the distance functioning, which will help you determine things like cost path analysis or uh, cross country mobility, and they'll derive these uh, these outputs and calculations from elevation models. You can also do things like spatial functions that let you calculate uh, band maximums between uh, various uh, various images and scenes. Um, and then we also uh, are we also provide uh, raster functions for multi-dimensional analysis. We'll, and we'll we'll dive into this a little bit later on in the in the webinar, but these are these are uh, data sets that contain mul multiple layers of raster information. So these tools can be used to do things like predict sea surface temperature, um, analyzing those trends over time, and uh, and even change change detection and analysis. So let's show you some examples of raster functions. Before we do that, I also do want to introduce to you the concept of raster products. So to start, what is a raster product? Well, a raster product is a, uh, you know, you can get, you can get uh, various images and rasters in raw formats. Raster products are completed formats which combine the metadata to, to allow you to work with it as a completed product and, and input 
various calculations and functions uh, as a completed product. So I'm going to add some Landsat imagery. As you can see here in this folder, uh, I have one you can see I have all of these raster data sets. This is all over the same area, over the same capture. And what you're seeing here is with each of these data sets, one individual band of the Landsat image. There are about 11 different bands. Um, and so we can work with the raw imagery in Pro. I can drag and drop in a layer, one of the bands, band five here. And it displays, but it's it's raw imagery, right? It's just it's just a single layer. So I can go to the image information and you know I can I can scroll over each pixel and it'll give me the spectral reading, but again, it's just that one band, right? So instead I want to work with the full raster data set, the raster product. I'm sorry. And so when we bring that in, that incorporates all of the, the different 11 bands associated with the image. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to mask the background of the said image. And so with this, uh, it gives us, when we, when we roll over the, with the image information tab, uh, we now see all of the band information. We can extract all of that information at any given time when we run our analysis. Um, it will also come with, depending on the, uh, the format of the data that you get it in, it will often come with uh, various different calculations, band combinations out of the box. So Landsat will let you switch between uh, different band combinations for different purposes such as land water interfaces or land use, vegetation analysis. And then you can also edit the function chain. And so this will, uh, this will allow you kind of like model builder um, to incorporate additional calculations into your imagery and, and create a finalized uh, uh, raster product that will, um, that, that shows the exact calculations and analysis of your imagery. So let's show an example of that. So we're gonna move over. This is a mosaic data set that we have of a collection of a uh, few hundred different planet images over uh, central California, um, some agricultural areas. And so what we've done with this data set is we've added some of these calculations to and as uh, what we refer to as processing templates. And so because we've added this, these processing templates to the Mosaic data set, uh, we're able to change the calculations on the fly. So that can be simple things like just changing the band combinations to uh, something like color infrared. But again, you can incorporate these uh, various raster functions such as you'll see in this tab here, you can incorporate those into your into your function chains, add them as uh, processing templates so that you can do more advanced calculations like NDVI. And again, if it's very fast, that calculation, because it's just it's just processing it on the fly, on the pixels. So it's kind of showing you up front first the hard work that we've done. Let's let's step you through the process with some of the individual images. So we're gonna zoom into an area of interest. We're gonna do some vegetation change calculations in this area. Now, again, I'm just working with the whole mosaic data set here. I just wanna calculate the differences between a couple images. We have uh, imagery that was taken um, from uh, March, to August during the year of this collect. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to come to my raster items explore. And this way I can pick out the different images that I wanna work with. Uh, think of this as kind of like a catalog that we can search for uh, imagery. 
And so I'm going to select the two images that I know. And now I can also even show the thumbnail of these images. You can see each image in the collection here that through, through filtering by various attributes, uh, I can ensure that these are the images that I want to work with. So I'll select both, one from March, one from August. And then I'll add these two images from the Mosaic data sets as separate items in the map. I'll turn off the Mosaic data set. And now you can see these are just the two images that we'll work with. And so from here, we'll go into our raster functions and we'll start again by doing just an NDVI colorized calculation. We'll do it on this, uh, this first data set here. The visible band is three and we know the infrared band is four. We can adjust the color map, how we want that shown. And you can see that the calculation is done very quick on, on this image. We'll do it again on the, on the second one. Again, this can be done very quickly because we're not writing out any new raster information here. We're just processing the pixels on the fly with these raster functions. And if we use our swipe tool, now you can see there has been a change in, in NDVI from between the certain months. So now we want, what we want to do is we want to have a raster that will just show the overall uh, difference between these between these two images. We don't want to have to swipe back and forth. So I'm going to use a different raster function. This one's the calculator function. We'll input different variables here. So we will select all right we need to do this one. And so if we do our subtraction T1 minus T2 in our calculator function, create a new layer. It now adds that additional raster into the map. And actually, I'm going to go back. I did get the variables incorrect T1. So we'll just do this again very quickly. There runs the calculation for us. Final thing that I want to do is use the composite bands function. And this will allow us to uh, combine these three calculations together. To show this in a colorized format. And so you can see here that the, that the red indicates uh, the areas uh, where, where NDVI has uh, increased over time. The blue areas is where the, these, these blue areas is where it has decreased. And so what we can do with this, uh, this raster function here, uh, you know, we've gone through the manual process of working with these. I also have the ability to save all of these steps together as, as a raster function chain. And then uh, we, can, we can incorporate these as custom tools, custom workflows, um, so that I can just simply input the, the, first, uh, the first two images and then, and then have this function run as, as a single tool. So pretty powerful stuff that you're able to, uh, you're able to do with 
ArcGIS Pro and you're able to do it very quickly. So I'm gonna jump back into my PowerPoint and we'll continue on. Um, so that was an introduction of some of the things you can do with Pro straight out of the box. Um, we did mention earlier that there are various extensions that you can use um, to enhance your, your uh, analysis capabilities in Pro. One of those we introduced a couple years ago called the Image Analyst Extension. Uh, the Image Analyst Extension provides various different capabilities. Not only does it provide advanced functionality and advanced tools for, for raster analysis, uh, thing you know providing tools such as image classification uh, the ability to edit pixels on the fly um, as well as uh, some deep learning tools some things all things that we're going to be able to see and visualize later on but it also lets you incorporate uh, imagery that has traditionally been difficult to incorporate into GIS um, such as uh, um, oblique imagery, uh, stereo imagery, and, and motion imagery as well. So we'll jump in, we'll show you some of these. Um, one, again, we provide the tools needed for uh, all classification workflows, both supervised and super unsupervised classification. And these can be object-based or pixel-based workflows. Um, for those who are very familiar with classification, those tools are available as individual uh, raster functions that you can work with. For those who aren't as familiar with the process, we also provide a, a wizard that kind of helps guide you through the process, um, takes you through the appropriate steps to get, to get results. So I'm going to actually combine that, uh, a presentation of that along with our pixel editor, uh, which as I stated earlier, allows you to manipulate pixels on the fly for easy analysis. So this is, uh, this is a neighborhood in, Kentucky, in, I believe just outside of Colorado. And so with this, uh, what we want to do is we want to identify all of the impervious surfaces, all of the area, all of the surfaces that uh, deflect rain. And so one of the things, so, so we ran a classification workflow to identify different types of land cover. So first we um, adjusted the band combinations to, to bring out that near infrared band, made sure that was shining. And then the first thing that we did with our classification tools, is we ran this uh, segmentation tool. And what this does is it groups neighboring pixels together based on uh, similar spectral readings next to each other. So you can see it did a pretty good job segmenting uh, those different types of images close together. And then from there, we use a training samples manager to identify various different uh, land cover types. So we would manually go through and identify what was a roof, what was what was grass, what was street, what was water, what was a shadow, et cetera. And when we had enough samples to that we felt confident that the uh, that the classification that the classified tool could recognize various different uh, land cover types, we ran that classified tool, and this is what we got. And so we were able to and with the uh, with the legend on the side, we're able to identify what's water, shadows, grass. Most importantly, we were able to identify what the impervious surfaces were: rooftops, roads, driveways, sidewalks, etc. And using GIS, we're able to combine uh, all of these uh, raster layers into a single image, and then we can combine them with uh, other GIS data layers. In this case, we combined it with parcel information so that we could identify which uh, parcels of land had the most impervious um, <coughs> impervious surfaces so that governments could use that to identify which, uh, which parcels were um, 
had the most runoff associated with them. Now, one of the things going back to the classified tools, we'll actually come down here. Um, didn't do the, it was able to pick up a lot of the impervious surfaces, but you can see that it, it didn't identify all of them. We didn't get enough training samples to, um, to not identify some of these areas, like this roof that it picked up as water. So what we can do here though, is we can use uh, our pixel editor tool to change these on the fly. And so what I'll do is I'll reclassify the entire object and I can just change that on my own to a shingled roof. So this is really handy for cleaning up uh, classification tools or classification workflows, um, especially if you're wanting to remove things like, like some of these, uh, these shadows and just identify them as trees. And so we can reclassify by region instead, just get rid of some of these shadows. Nice and easy. This tool is also nice for um, redacting pixels, removing clouds from images, replacing, uh, replacing with other pixels and so on. So moving on. I actually want to give you a demo here of uh, what we refer to as image coordinate space and mensuration. So with highly oblique imagery, imagery that's not been taken from nadir at an angle, <clears throat> in the past has been very difficult to incorporate into your GIS uh, because it will adjust it. It will, it will geocorrect uh, where where the, uh, where the imagery shows in a north is up perspective. And so when it's taken at an angle, you can see like buildings and such. This is along the coast of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, buildings are placed on their sides. This mountain, if we turn on our swipe tool here, it's crumbling into the ocean. Doesn't match up with the shoreline. And again, it's because it's a very highly oblique image. However, with, uh, with the image analyst extension and the ability, we have the ability to make this a focusable image and transfer it into image coordinate space. And so now we see the image from the perspective of the sensor. Now the buildings, the mountains, everything appears as it's supposed to. And this will make it very easy for, um, Measuring different, measuring various different contents. If we come to our mensuration tools, these are highly accurate um, measurement tools based off of the metadata of the imagery. So now we can get an accurate measurement on the height of these buildings, etc. This will also make it much easier. We move back into map space and we switch over here to this airport. With this airport, you can see that we're trying to capture information um, through, uh, through different point and polygon features. Viewing this information from image coordinate space makes it, makes it much easier to capture uh, information about the rooftops and the locations much more accurately. And then switching it back into map mode, all of the geography uh, associated with these, um, with, with, the, uh, with the observation captures uh, will display appropriately in the map as well. So we'll keep pressing onward. Sorry, I am displaying. Another highlight is uh, 
of the image analyst extension is full motion video, sometimes referred to as motion imagery. So what this does is it allows you to incorporate video that has the correct metadata for geographic display. This is something that we refer to as MISB compliance, M-I-S-B. Um, and what this information includes is things like uh, your field of view, your, your sensor location and pitch, et cetera. And so what it will do is it'll allow you to display your field of view and, and sensor location within your maps and your 3D scenes. Um, and it provides a video player to play alongside of that. Um, so these can be live streams of video. They can be local um, archived videos that exist as well. So we'll show a demonstration of that quickly. This is an example of a defense type workflow that FMV would be very utilized for what we refer to as uh, the follow, a car follow. And so you can see in this scene that we see where the sensor is located. We can see its field of view and its line of sight as well. So we can, we can zoom into that location, what it's seeing, and then you're provided again with, uh, with the video player that allows you to fast forward, um, skip ahead to certain points in time, pause if you will, jump back. And we can even have this uh, follow the video on its own. And this will allow you to transfer different data um, from the video to the map uh, and vice versa. So one of the things that we can do is uh, we can capture breadcrumbs of this uh, of this car to show where it's gone. So we can take a point feature and we can actually drop that point feature directly into the video itself. And it will place the corresponding features in the map where they're supposed to go. We can also take uh, frame snapshots. So we can take this video frame and with a single click, it's going to add that frame to the map and georeference it on the fly. So again, there's a lot of various different uh, applicate uh, tools such as uh, North Arrow, and the ability to measure directly inside the video that make it very easy to get information from the video and incorporate it with the rest of your GIS. So that concludes uh, my portion of the demo that's an intro to the image analyst extension. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it back over to Vinay. You guys, she, you guys can see my screen? Yep. All right. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about multidimensional analysis. So before I dive in, I wanted to provide some kind of context to why multidimensional data is important or rather why should you spend the next 10 minutes listening to me? If you're not a frequent user of multidimensional data, you might begin to wonder how can it help in your problem solving? Now, this is becoming uh, more and more vital to understand how, why, and where things are changing. It's not just what changes have occurred. You might be interested in using historical raster data to predict fl flood locations, or you might want to model carbon stocks over time. Either which way you're looking to find anomalies, explore trends, forecast, or perform predictive analysis and evaluate changes. All of this is done using time series data or multidimensional data. So 
there are so many questions that we can really answer using multi-dimensional data. Now, when working with multi-dimensional data, you need tools to also leverage those multiple dimensions and variables so that you could dig deeper into your data cube. You need tools to splice through your data. You can identify anomalies or aggregate large volumes of data into weekly data, for example. You need tools to detect harmonic trends, which can then be used to predict future changes, right? And then you need tools to perform time series change detection. These are just some of the analysis tools that we will be going over in a bit. Now, all of these tools are accessible across ArcGIS Pro. It's accessible in the map viewer and you can scale out all of your processing using ArcGIS image server as well. Uh, I'll show you a couple demonstrations where I'm going to be using our APIs, the Python API, and I'll use ArcPy to automate tasks. And it's also useful for developers, you know, when you want to build customized applications. Okay, so the first demonstration is going to be visualizing. Okay, so step one is I've got multi-dimensional data. How do I bring it into the application? How do I bring it into ArcGIS Pro? It's easy, you get into a map, add data, just like how you normally pull in any kind of data sets. But in this case, you can pick multi-dimensional raster layer, which is a specific type of data set. And the reason why we do that is it's different in the sense you can import specific variables or specific data sets or a multi-dimensional slice from a mosaic data set or an image service, right? So in this case, I got imagery that I've received from Copernicus on the Copernicus website. You can pull down the data set and say, you know, I want to pull down the sea surface temperature data set or the total precipitation. And in some cases, there are over 50 different variables. So you can select the variables that you need, pull it in as a multi-dimensional raster, or in this case, we'll pull it in as a multi-dimensional, multivariate raster. Now, what happens when you do that is it loads it as a container. And when I say container, it's a data cube that contains multiple variables. So in this case, I could switch to water temperature and you can switch through multiple periods of time. And lastly, you can easily go through different depths. So you see in a matter of clicks, I've sliced and diced my data set going through different uh, variables, a dimension of time and a dimension of depth. So this is simple exploration of imagery or multi-dimensional data directly with an ArcGIS Pro. You can take this a step further and this is pretty slick, the next uh, demonstration. You guys have probably heard of voxels. The voxel layer is something we've introduced in ArcGIS Pro 2.6. This is another neat way to visualize and slice out your multi-dimensional data within Pro. So this data, this is the ecological marine units data and the data is subsurface in the next click you'll understand what i mean by that so here we can go through multiple surfaces you can see the complete data stack right in here now there are different things you could do you can visualize it this way you can change the lighting effects, right? And in this case, this data set, we have a boatload of variables. You can pick any variable that you wanna work with. In this case, it's the apparent oxygen utilization. And then you have additional capabilities such as you can filter certain values that you want, right? So in this case, I've picked out certain values that I want and based off of specific control points, you can even apply transparency to your data. So you have complete control over your transparency settings as well. 
Now, in addition to that, you can create multiple surfaces. So for instance, here's an ISO surface. I'll bring up the symbology for that. And likewise here as well, you have the ability to slice through multiple or work through multiple slices. You can control the transparency. And here I want to section my data. I can work through my data as well. So this is just simple ways. There's vertical exaggeration as well that you can uh, use to visualize your data more intuitively. So these were just two simple ways to quickly visualize your data in 2D and 3D, your multidimensional data in both 2D and 3D. Next, I'll dive into analysis. And here what I'm going to do is I'm going to predict, I'm working on predicting coral breaching uh, using sea surface temperature data. So here you're looking at sea surface temperature data and the data, what I'm going to do is predict sea surface temperature out to 2030 and explore how this can affect marine species. This Slide, sorry, this imagery is an image cube that has 2000 weekly slices of sea surface temperature data that's collected over the past 30 years. Right. Now, using the trend tool here, the first step is to analyze the temperature trends over the image cube. On the multi-dimensional tab, we can call, we can invoke the trend analysis tool and generate a trend raster. And this result is a trend analysis raster showing increasing or decreasing temperature trends. Now on the back end, essentially, it's harmonic coefficients that have been generated. Why is it generated? This data set is used as an input in the next step. Basically, we take this as an input in the new into the new prediction tool. This is a tool. Here we specify the time intervals and we create the predicted data set. The result is a global prediction map of monthly sea surface temperatures that is all generated on the fly. And the, the data set, like I told you, is predicted out to 2030. And now that we have a predicted data set, we can create a temperate profile, right? You can explore regions, you can explore ecosystems that will be affected by these future temperature increases. For example, here you see a graph, I've picked a point uh, off of the Pacific coast of Mexico. Mexico. You, you can see a cyclical temperature pattern, and this is primarily due to seasonality. Uh, however, if you look at the red line in here, this shows, it clearly shows uh, over time by 2030, we are, it, there's an increasing trend in temperature. So by the year 2030, you'll see an increase in temperature up to a degree or two degrees. Now this might seem small, but it makes a big difference to different marine ecosystems. We can take this predictive analysis one step further and with a series of geoprocessing tools, you can create a time series risk map to visualize areas that are experiencing prolonged heat stress. So this is, um, we're gonna get everything all the way up to 2030 and you can see the time slider as well. Here's 2023 May and here's data September of 2023 and likewise you can you know step through different time steps and visualize the data. Here you can see the Gulf of Mexico extended periods of prolonged heat stress in July of 2028. This can intensify weather activity and it can affect marine life within the within this region. Here's another scenario this is the coral triangle and in August of 2028, we can predict 
there's going to be severe heat stress, which can lead to bleaching of coral reefs. The applications, you know, as I've just shown you, I've just shown you two quick examples. So the applications for this type of predictive analysis is really endless. Depends on the types of data sets that you're consuming, the, data, the types of data sets that you're working with, the applications are really endless. All of these workflows, you can do them even directly from within notebooks. And here, what I've done is once I've extracted all of those features, I've just drawn it on top of, um, uh, and I've, I've ingested the points directly with an operations dashboard. I've enriched coral reef station points, and it can be presented in an interactive configurable dashboard just like this, right? Where we can predict the activity into the future by just picking any given date. So for instance, in this case, I have June 2020, we could hit the drop down and pick any date that is of interest. Now I'll show you another example, and this time we'll use the ArcGIS API for Python. It's the same scenario or similar scenario. In the same case, what I'm trying to do is identify regions where coral reefs are going to be threatened by climate change. And the reason why I'm showing you the same workflow is essentially for the developer crowd, right? We have developers who are trying to build web applications or developers who are trying to automate tasks or put together notebooks. Here's a typical example. You can put this together using ArcGIS notebooks, simply using Python API. So first step, bleaching is tied to ocean temperatures. So I'm using the Living Atlas data set, the sea surface temperature data from the Living Atlas. And like I told you, it's a cube that contains multiple slices of imagery, right? And in this case, it's about 4,000 slices of imagery. Now, what I want to do is for my analysis, I just need weekly imagery. So step one is we condense the data and this is the process of what we're doing. We're taking the entire data stack and condensing it only to this much. So instead of daily imagery, I just condense it down to weekly slices of imagery. The next step is calling the generate trend raster. And this is the same process that I just showed you with an ArcGIS Pro. This is the result. This result is then used for predictive analysis. It goes to predict the future sea surface temperature. And we've got the predict using, uh, predict using trend raster function, which invokes the process using raster analytics on our server. And yeah, keep in mind the processing for everything that I'm showing you now is running on my server. So I'm using image server for this process. Everything that I showed you previously was on the desktop. And this is the result of my predicted data set. It goes all the way to 2030. Now a question a lot of people have is, I predicted the data set, but how accurate is it? So here we have a set of validation tools. I've picked a point, a set of points on the predicted data set and the original seed data set. And when we compare the observed versus the predicted, this is what it looks like. So it's pretty damn accurate. And then we calculate the temperature anomalies and the periods of prolonged heating weeks because think of it like your front lawn, your front garden, right? If you don't, if you don't water your lawn for about a day or two days, it turns brown, but then once you water it, it comes back to life. But if you don't water it for more than three weeks, it dies. And that's the same case with coral. So that's what we're trying to identify. That's what we're trying to figure out here. Find out the prolonged heating week. Once we've identified that, we can visualize the predicted risk of bleaching. Here, we've done it at a global scale. And here I've extracted or enriched key station points that are provided by NOAA. And I've enriched those points just to show you where are the regions that are going to be affected for a given time period. So that was a simple you know, end-to-end -end workflow where I used ArcGIS Pro initially, and then I used the ArcGIS API for Python to uh, achieve similar, uh, similar workflow.
Okay, so the next demonstrations that I want to show you is using ArtPy for raster analysis. And uh, scientists essentially, they use satellites, satellite data to calculate time series NDVI data. And this is used to extract phenological metrics for entire crop season, crop growing season. So this is the arcpi.ia module that we've introduced. It's been a couple of releases actually. This is just a graphical representation of what the workflow looks like. We have Landsat data that exists on the Landsat PDS bucket, pull it into the Mosaic data set, create a raster collection, and all of this is done using ArcPy. Filter out our data set, pre-process NDVA, and do a curve fitting. So step one is creating your raster collection. We create a raster collection uh, object. This is my Mosaic data set location. You can filter based on location, time, and extent. And out of the total collection of about 5,000 rasters, based on my filtered rasters, we've come down to about 400 images. You can visualize the table. This gives you an idea of the metadata if you want to look at the metadata. And then you can visualize the rasters as well. So in this case, I've locked to a specific raster and I can see what the raster looks like. And then I can apply a series of raster functions. So in this case, I'm calling the mask function. I'm using the quality band from the Landsat scenes. And essentially I've written a custom algorithm so that I can mask out clouds because that is critical when you're working with time series data your data has to be analytic ready. So I've masked out clouds in this case. Next is we call the NDVI function. All of our raster functions are accessible as methods and functions within the ArcPy API. This is what the result looks like. And then we pass a point or a location. In this case, it could be interactive or in this case, I've given a specific point and then we can visualize the temporal profile of the NDVI values. So this is the profile for all of the NDVI values. Based on this, you can normalize your data for each month. Oops, sorry. You can normalize your data for each month. You can fit the curve, which then gives you the phenological metrics. Okay, so additional scenarios. Um, those were that was just one example that I covered today, you know, where I talked about prediction, I'll be talking about change in a bit, then there's trends as well. There are several more cases which we obviously don't have the time to go over completely right now. This slide just lists some of those other scenarios that we worked on. Uh, top left, using NASA's atmospheric science data, we were able to predict future energy resources. Then next using a uh, multi-dimensional winds data set. We can use that to predict future weather phenomena using the predictive tools that I just showed you. A multi-dimensional data set with temperature and precipitation, soil moisture can be used in agricultural applications. Uh, it's used for determining suitable locations and time periods to grow specific types of crops. Then, you can use multi-dimensional analysis tools to see how ice concentration has changed in the Ar Arctic. We use data from the National Snow and Ice Data Center to map the trend in sea ice concentration over the past 30 years. We found that trends and anomalies vary widely depending on location, but that overall, most locations in the Arctic are experiencing sea loss over time, sea ice loss over time. And likewise, there's plant hardiness zones, there's pollution regulation that you can do, uh, urbanization, understanding urbanization a little better. So here, what I was trying to you know, highlight is it's not just working with sea surface temperature or science or scientific data. 
You can use this for a variety of purposes to perform predictive analysis using commercial satellite imagery. The next, oops. Okay, so we've done some work in change detection as well, change detection on time series data. This is useful on scenario and useful for data, scenarios like illegal mining, deforestation, land use management, and breaking it down, we have two key types of change detection. There's image to image detection, the change detection, that's super fast, low computation, it's highly needed, it's a highly needed tool. It takes one raster, takes another raster and computes either the absolute difference, the percent difference or categorical change. I'll show you this in a demonstration so you understand that better. In this case, typically you know there is change but you wanna quantify the change. That's when you use that tool. Next method is a little more complex. Uh, it's change detection for a time series data. This uses the CCDC algorithm to identify abrupt change while accounting for seasonality as well, right? Because sometimes when you're working through time series data, it could be that change is occurring just because of seasonality. Crops are declining. That's because you're switching from spring to summer to winter. So a CCDC algorithm, it accounts for seasonal changes as well. And that being said, you have to keep in mind, this is a very rigorous process consuming or performing CCDC analysis. It has specific input requirements and it's heavy on compute resource usage. Now I'll do a demo and image to image change detection. Okay. So here, what you're looking at is land cover data set, which I've pulled in from the Living Atlas. This is freely accessible land cover data set that goes all the way from 2000 to 2016, I believe. So this is the 2016 data. And you see, we have a few clusters over here. This is a land cover data set. This is the new change detection tool. Here I can provide my raster one and my second raster, and I wanna see categorical change. The result is this. You'll see the legend is fairly long, right? because this indicates all of the different class changes. It shows you all of the classes, what has it changed from and what has it changed to. So if I pull up the attribute table, you'll see So it gives me the class name, the new class name, and what did it change from? What was it in 2016, or oh, sorry, 2001? And now what does it look like in 2016, right? Now this is fantastic information. It's really useful information. And it can be, the beauty is you can use it for a variety of purposes. I wanna see urbanization, then I can reclassify my data and I can check out only urbanization. In this scenario, I want to see where do we have water loss and what's here I've zoomed into Lake Mead and you'll see an interesting example of change in water bodies. This is what the water looked like in 2001 and in 2016, you've seen a lot of water that has been lost over here, decline in water bodies. Likewise, there's urban sprawl that can be detected. You know, it's just a matter of remapping your classes into what exactly you want to extract or what exactly you want to work for, look for. Okay. 
next is All right, now a little more on a deep learning story within ArcGIS. We started off with integration with third-party frameworks a couple years ago. Now we have a tight end-to-end -end story. In Pro 2.6 more specifically, all existing tools have been enhanced. And as part of the Python API, we've added support for a whole bunch of models to support new tasks. Additionally, these new models now support a variety of new data types. So it's not just imagery, there's point cloud, bathymetric data, LIDAR, video, oriented imagery, uh, just to name a few. Okay. Now, my previous slide, I talked about support for a variety of data types, correct? Now, honing in on imagery, why is deep learning important? There is a fire hose of imagery that is streaming down the pipe daily. We've got planet, we've got digital globe, there's Capella space that's gonna come out. Capella space, in fact, every three hours, they're gonna provide you with imagery. There's sentinel imagery coming down once every five days for any given geography. So the amount of imagery that's coming down the pipe is phenomenal. So it's not just management that is turning out to be a nightmare. The traditional approach to take a couple images, extract features, that doesn't scale anymore. Hence, we need deep learning. We're essentially teaching the machine to extract features for you. Now, breaking it down, here's the workflow within ArcGIS. Step one, you collect training samples. We have an intuitive user experience for doing this. You can either use the editing tools from ArcGIS Pro or the map viewer, or you can use the new user experience. Step two is generate training chips, uh, training chips, which is used to train your deep learning model. Step three is where we train the neural network. And the last step, using out of the box tools, we can run inferencing or detect objects, detect features, extract features. Now I'll dive uh, directly into demos. I've got a series of demos. Unfortunately, I have about 11 deep learning demos, but unfortunately I'll have to stick with four given our time constraints. So this is one of the demonstrations which I typically show because it's a good end-to-end -end workflow. Um, so to start with the scenario, this is the uh, Woolsey fires, which occurred late of 2018. And this red border is the fire perimeter. What we wanna do is identify buildings. We have about 10,000 different buildings within this location. And I want to identify or classify those images, uh, those buildings as uh, either damaged or undamaged. So step one is I need to capture a bunch of training samples. And to do that, we have, I can pick an image and go label objects for deep learning. And here we can go through the process of actually capturing training samples. So this was a damage structure. Here's another damage structure. We can continue. And in this case, you can also create a new feature, right? I can add a new class. So I call this undamaged. So green. Okay. And this can go on, you know, we can go on uh, capturing training samples and we need a good collection of training samples when you're running, when you're trying to train a deep learning model. So in the interest of time, I've captured about uh, 
900 training samples out of the total uh, buildings, total number of buildings that we need to uh, classify. And let me just turn on the total number of buildings. Yeah, so these blue buildings are everything that we need to classify. So now that we have a training samples, next step is you head over to the export training tool, specify a mask if needed. And in this case, it would be the building footprint, for instance, or the fire perimeter would be appropriate. You can specify the tile size, stride size. Um, we have all of these examples well documented. And there are a series of uh, parameters. The metadata format varies on the type of problem that you're trying to solve. Once you run the tool, this goes out and creates a bunch of chips. And this is what the chips look like. These chips are provided to, uh, these chips are then being used to train your deep learning model. You're essentially telling the system, this is what a damaged building looks like. And this is what an undamaged building looks like. Once we're done with that, you can head over to the image analyst toolbox. You have the deep learning tool set. And within the tool set, you have some of the deep learning tools. So you head over to model training, specify your input location of your image chips. So this lets you specify the input location for your input chips. You can specify the model, the predefined model that you want to use to train your deep learning model. And there are advanced parameters which you can tweak. Now it's not recommended, but if you're an advanced user, you would feel, uh, uh, feel free to make those, make those changes. Now, while this shows up, I'm not sure why is it taking so long, but while this shows up, I can show you some of the results. So essentially here, I've zoomed out. Okay, the app is not gonna respond till this pain responds. I'll switch to the next deep learning demo and I'll come back to this one just to give you some more context. Okay. So the next is an interesting problem where we do cloud detection. So here I've got an image, a Landsat image that has a bunch of clouds, right? What I wanna do in this case is identify or mask out these clouds. Now, a lot of data providers, they provide you with masks or a mask band, which can be used to hide clouds or to mask out clouds. But in this case, what we got is a mosaic image, right? So that's the Landsat training scene. In which case you don't have the mask. You don't have the ability to work with a mask. So using the cap capturing, Next step is I go ahead, I capture training samples and identify locations that are clouds. And this is what it looks like. Once we have this, we go through the same process of training a deep learning model. Hopefully that is done and I can show you that. Yeah, so you provide a deep learning model, uh, your input data set, your output model. You can provide model parameters like do you wanna do object detection or pixel classification in case of detecting clouds, uh, object classification. So we have different types of models that are supported depending on the workflow that you're trying to achieve. Coming back to this um, scenario now that the app has responded, this is what our results look like. We basically classified everything. Zooming in a little tighter, you'll see that the results are almost equal, if not better than a trained assessor. Now, the benefit of having deep learning within ArcGIS is you have access to the complete ecosystem. So uh, I've used this as an input to network analyst, and I've identified locations where we can plant 
shelters for users. So these are all of the different regions and these are single points where we can put different shelters. Going back to the next problem that we're trying to solve, identifying clouds. I've trained my deep learning model using the same process. And then here I've detected clouds. some reason that's a little slow to respond. Okay, so once the clouds are detected, the next step is we need to mask out those clouds and fill in pixels. So this is a two-step process. Step one is rather interesting when I get it to work and show up. Uh, okay, it's not responding as yet. And the next step is essentially filling in those pixel values. Now we've used, we've got a new image in painting model. So using that in painting model, I've generated a mask. So this is the same thing that essentially I would be doing in the previous demo. Detected all clouds, created a mask over here, right? Once we have the mask, this is the image in painting model that is used. So we've trained it, all of the clouds have been hidden and we've simulated or we've created, synthetically we've generated an image. So that was urban area and here's another location. And you can see that the system has done a fairly good job of masking all clouds all over the location, all over the region. And now I have my last deep learning demo. This is shipwrecks. And here what we're trying to do is, and what I'm trying to show is also, I'm not just working with multi-spectral imagery. In this case, what we're trying to do is work with bathymetric data, elevation data, and identify ships or identify shipwrecks. The location is Jamaica Bay, the New York area. And the uh, Hurricane Sandy is, uh, it, back in 2012, this region was affected by Hurricane Sandy. And what we're trying to do is identify locations where we have shipwrecks because that could affect existing boats and ships when they're traveling through those regions. So again, it's the same process. I go through capturing training samples. This is my bathymetric data. I've captured a bunch of training samples and we go through a notebook this time. I prepare the data. I train my deep learning model using my learning rate finder. I find the approximate learning rate I call the model fit and you can visualize the results and assess the accuracy. This was just about 29 different epochs. And now we rerun the process, train it further and improve the results. And you'll see 69 epochs have been run and the results are pretty good. After that, all that we have to do is call the model save and then you can run inferencing using either ArcGIS Pro or you can use Int Enterprise. And here's one location where we have a bunch of live detections. This is automatically detected using the system. Now, how is this useful? This is NOAA's map. This is a nautical chart that is provided by NOAA. And you'll notice they have one detection here. There's another detection here, but you saw our live detections were all over the place. So what we did is once we generated that, we generated an updated shipwreck map. 
So that is a huge difference. You see those two there, but in addition to that, there's a whole collection of shipwrecks that have been identified. So that's another scenario. That's another end-to-end -end example of how we've used notebooks for training your deep learning model. And it's not just imagery. I'm using rasters to perform deep learning and extract information. Got a couple more slides to quickly go through. Uh, how much time do we have? There's one more demo that I have, the map viewer. Uh, so Vinay, if we could wrap up in a couple minutes. Okay, okay. So map viewer, we made several enhancements. Uh, you can perform analysis using the map viewer. So raster function and editor, applying raster functions. We ported all of that from ArcGIS Pro into the map viewer. What's interesting or what's exciting is all of this is coming into ArcGIS Online as well. That is in a beta state right now. If anybody of you is interested, are interested in this, reach out to Kurt and make, and we can make that happen so that you can take a look at hosted imagery. Uh, Python libraries, I talked about this. I've shown you a few examples. Uh, I showed you how it was, a lot of the workflows were done from within Pro and how it was done using the ArcGIS API for Python as well. Essentially, we beefed up our developer story, a powerful story for developers who are seeking to automate their workflows. So these are 1,300 comprehensive GIS tools that is available through ArcPy. The ArcGIS API for Python, you have 2,300 methods and functions. And lastly, there's Rasta Analytics, which essentially is distributed processing. So I showed you how you could process all of your imagery locally. But if you really want to scale out your processing, you can author your processing using ArcGIS Pro or web applications or developers can do that. And then you can leverage portal or enterprise, which will distribute your processing to the available cluster of machines and write out the results as a new WebGIS layer. So cycling back or circling back to our first slide, as you've seen today, ArcGIS has powerful image analysis capabilities. These are just some of the tools and this, what we've done today is we've just skimmed the surface of what is really available within ArcGIS. All right. So time for some questions. Yeah, th thanks for that, Vinay. Um, are you able to see my screen on your side, Vinay? Can you confirm yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so for those of you guys uh, who, are, who are still with us, which is uh, most of the group, uh, fantastic pr presentation, uh, Vinay and, and Kyle. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat that I'll just uh, go over briefly. If you got additional questions, uh, go ahead and, and write them in. We got about eight minutes, so we're gonna try to get uh, through these quickly. Um, but uh, I'm going to ask for a class participation uh, personnel who, who attended. If you could pull out your phones and uh, and just scan that QR code uh, right there on, on the PowerPoint, it would really help us a lot to to hear from hear from you guys, so we can better these presentations and also uh, uh, best support you as as a customer. Uh, so, Vinay, I, I wanted to start with with this question. I'll pose it directly to you. Uh, yeah. Are are these Notebooks available uh, for beginners in Esri training is, is one question we got. Yeah, we have a series of uh, notebooks that we've made available. One is when you deploy enterprise, you'll see it there. But then if you get onto the documentation of the ArcGIS API for Python, we've got a ton of notebooks.